This is a short book, but we've got a lot to cover, so let's jump into it. Um, don't exactly know when the book of Obadiah was dated. I think some of the more conservative dates would put it in the 8th century BC, but it's, it's one of the most broadly dated books of all the minor prophets. Some people put it in the 500s BC. Some of them people put it in the 800s. On this chart, you can see it's, it's actually dated around the 800s BC. Some people would suggest that because when you, when you have the minor prophets, you have Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah. Obadiah is listed fourth, that perhaps there's some sense of chronology there, at least a little bit. Um, but, but we don't really actually know. So I'm not going to really talk about dating that much on it. Um, Obadiah's name means worshiper of Jehovah. And we don't know a lot about this guy, Obadiah, other than this one thing that he wrote. He had a really common name. There's a lot of Obadiahs in your Bible. Um, but in Obadiah chapter 1 and verse 1, it reads this way. It says, The vision of Obadiah, thus says the Lord God concerning Edom. We have heard a report from the Lord, and a messenger has been sent among the nations, saying, Arise, and let us rise up against her for battle. And so, um, verse 2 has a warning. Behold, I will make you small among the nations. You shall be greatly despised. So these first couple of verses tell us a couple of things. It tells us that Obadiah is the one who's writing here. It tells us that the Lord is speaking to him, and thus he is relaying prophecy. It tells us who he is addressing in the prophecy, and that is Edom. This is the, the Lord God's um, vision concerning Edom. Something has been heard about Edom. God has heard it, and he's sending a messenger to call Edom to repentance and to warn them. Um, for us to understand Obadiah's prophetic warnings to Edom, then we need to familiarize ourselves with the history of the nation of Edom. And so this is going to be kind of like a, a history class uh, with regard to that particular nation tonight, because once we understand more about that nation and their biblical history, then we're going to understand a little bit more about why Obadiah says what he does in this prophecy. A little bit of map work, first of all. These are the nations of Canaan. Of course, they had to drive out certain nations that were in Canaan's land, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, the Hittites, the Kenites, the Amalekites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Sidonians. Uh, these are some of the uh, nations that they drove out or they had to fight against before they went into the Promised Land. Here's the Jordan River. And when they were wandering in the wilderness, um, they had to defeat, of course, some of the Ammonites and some of the uh, people from the kingdom of Og, um, the Amorites, before they crossed that river and started conquering this land. But down south here, on the southeastern um, border, if you will, uh, from at least southeast of where uh, the, the promised land, Canaan's land, their territory was, um, sit the Moabites, the Moabites. Here's kind of a closer look. Um, um, south of Moab, we have Edom. Um, and south of the Moabites would be the Edomites down here. So this is Edom. Here's some of the major cities of Edom, Selah, um, Kadesh Barnea. Uh, to the south border, you have Elath and Ezion Geber. Um, Petra is uh, a city we're going to look at a little bit here tonight. But these are some of the cities that were in Edom. Um, if you take a look at this quote from Jack Lewis, he says this, Edom occupied a narrow mountainous strip of territory. So this is a mountainous area. He says there are mountain peaks that range up to 5,700 feet. So you're looking at mountains that are a mile high. Um, this strip of land was about 100 by 20 miles in dimensions. It's located on the eastern side of the Palestinian Rift Valley. It's bounded on the east by desert. So over here is the Arabian Desert. So you can imagine extremely dry, extremely hot. Um, as you go east there and you come down off the mountains. Um, it says it's bounded by the desert. Um, and uh, Edom means the red region, which name is probably to be connected with the red rocks that are abundant in the territory. I'm going to show you a few pictures here in a moment. Seir, which is mentioned in Genesis 32 and verse 3. It's mentioned in Deuteronomy 2, mentioned in Judges 5 and verse 4. That's another biblical name for the Edomite region. So if you see the word Seir, we're talking about Edomite territory in the Bible. And it refers to the mountain range that runs north and south 
through its entire length. Um, so if we are talking about the Smokies um, here in America, you might kind of think of Tennessee. You can call it Tennessee, or you can say that, you know, the Smokies run through it. Uh, you might think a little bit of Tennessee, you might think a little bit about that North Carolina border, but when you think of Seir, uh, this is Edomite area here. Um, here's one of the key things about the Edomite territory is that there was a highway that went through that territory. Um, Edom's connected, as I mentioned, to the Arabian Desert over here, and this is the King's Highway, which if you look at the close-up here, um, that's the King's Highway right there that would have run um, on the east side of the Jordan, on the east side of the Dead Sea, and that King's Highway was a major caravan route that ran through the territory of Edom. Um, and because of that, it's a trade route. You have wealthy people coming, having to go that way. Because of that, Edom was made very wealthy due to controlling this strategic trade route. Um, geographically, Edom was also placed in a very advantageous position because of the mountain range. There was kind of only one way in, one way out. It was easy to protect because of that, um, because it was hard to get to, um, and because because it was a trade route, they oftentimes pillaged and um, oppressed the people who were traveling along that trade route um, so that they could get more money from them. And so <clears throat> that's, that's kind of a quick, uh, quick look at Edom. The Edomites were descendants of, yeah, Rick? Which son of Mo Noah were they of? The Edomites were, were from, they were, they were descended from... Um, Lot, right? Moab and Ammon were descended um, from. Well, no, 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 no. Moab and Ammon were descended from Lot. My bad. Um, Esau was the father of the Edomites, as we're looking at here. So we're talking about Jacob and Esau. So we're talking about, um, we'd be talking about Shem. Um, they were descendants of Shem and then Abraham and then the descendants of Abraham. Um, and Genesis 36 tells us that. Um, it tells us that Esau was the father of the Edomites. So the Edomites descend from him. So really, you've got Jacob and you have Esau. Uh, Jacob's descendants, of course, become the children of Israel. Um, the descendants of Esau become the Edomites. And historically, um, they, they become warring nations. They're, there's a lot of strife between the descendants of Jacob and the descendants of Esau. And that was prophesied. Even when um, the mother of Jacob and Esau was pregnant, in Genesis 25, 23, Jehovah said to her, two nations are in your womb. Two peoples shall be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. And of course, the younger is Jacob. Um, the older Esau is going to serve Jacob. And so the more powerful nation is going to be, um, over time, the nation of Israel. Now, strife arose between the two nations when... Jacob stole the birthright. And so it really starts with Jacob, the father of Israel, and, and Esau, the father of Edomites. It starts when Jacob steals his birthright. In Genesis 27, verse 35, it says, He said, Your brother came with deceit. This is the father of Jacob saying this. I know Isaac. Your brother came with deceit and has taken away your blessing. And Esau said, Is he not rightly named Jacob? For he has supplanted me these two times. He took away my birthright, and now look, he has taken away my blessing. And he said, have you not reserved a blessing for me? Esau's upset at this point. Why? Because he's taken the birthright, he's taken the blessing. So Jacob and Esau are at conflict, really, over inheritance issues and things of that nature. Um, though the brothers later reconciled, you read about that in Genesis, that they do, after a period of time, come together and sort of um, try to make peace with each other there's still bad blood between their descendants. And so strife arises between the descending nations. And I'm gonna show you some of the encounters between um, the descendants of Esau and of course the children of Israel. So here's encounter number one. After 40 years of wandering, Israel was getting ready to enter into the promised land. And they sought permission because they were out in the wilderness. They sought permission as they made their way towards the promised land to pass through Edom. And it makes sense because there was a big highway that went through Edom that they all were going to need to travel through. 
But Edom refused. Edom would not let the descendants of Jacob, the children of Israel, pass through the territory. So Israel had to detour. They kind of had to take the very long route to get um, into the territory where they were headed. You read about it in Numbers 20. It says this in verse 17. They say, please let us pass through your land. They're very polite about it. Please let us pass through your land. We will not pass through field or vineyard. We won't drink water from a well. We will go along the king's highway. So there are the king's highways documented in Numbers 20. We will not turn aside to the right hand or to the left until we have passed through your territory. But Edom said to him, you shall not pass through lest I come out with the sword against you. You try to take the highway through our land, we're going to kill you. And so Edom's not very friendly to basically people who were kind of their, their cousins. Um, they were relatives, um, but they were not willing to let them come through. You read in Numbers chapter, skip the slide there, verse 19, Numbers 20, verse 19. The people of Israel said to him, we will go up by the highway, and if we drink of your water, I and my livestock, then I will pay for it. Let me only pass through on foot, nothing more. But he said, you shall not pass through. And Edom came out against them with a large army and with a strong force. And so Edom refused to give Israel passage through his territory. So Israel turned away from him. So they have to go a different route. So this is kind of one of the first infractions. Um, here's the second infraction. Saul, when you read in 1 Samuel 14, 47, he fought against Edom. And so verse 47 says, when Saul had taken the kingship over Israel, he fought against all his enemies on every side, against Moab, against the Ammonites, against Edom. So um, he's actually successful here as well. Edom seems to overpower, at least by threat, the people of Israel in the first encounter. But here Saul turns the tables on them. Um, he defeated the kings of Zobah, the Philistines, and wherever he turned, he routed them. And so he defeats the Edomites. You read also about David, Saul first king of the United Kingdom, David the second king of that United Kingdom of Israel, and David also defeats Edom. In 2 Samuel 8 and verse 14, that's encounter number three in the scriptures, he put garrisons in Edom. So David actually builds some fortress areas. Throughout all Edom, he put garrisons, and all the Edomites became David's servants. What was the prophecy, by the way, even before Jacob and Esau were born? Um, the the older is going to serve the younger. And this is really the fulfillment of that prophecy. David subdues the Edomites, and the Edomites become David's servants, just as God had said, even before Jacob and Esau were born. And the Lord gave victory to David wherever he went. Well, we have another encounter, though. At a later time, Edom revolted. So they get tired of being the servants of David. And they revolt. And you read about that in 2 Kings chapter 8 and verse 20. This is during the time of the divided kingdom. So years later, it says, in his days, and he's referring to one of the kings there, in his days, Edom revolted from the rule of Judah and set up a king of their own. So the Edomites say, we're going to set up our own kingdom. We're not going to be ruled by your king. And then Joram passed over to Zare with all his chariots and rose by night. He and his chariot commanders struck the Edomites who had surrounded him, but his army fled home. So another conflict between Israel and Edom. So Edom revolted from the rule of Judah to this day, and Libna revolted at the same time. So Edom's revolting. And then we have a prediction um, that Jeremiah makes prior to um, perhaps Obadiah. Jeremiah says this in Jeremiah 49 and verse 17. It says, Edom shall become a horror. Everyone who passes by it will be horrified and will hiss because of all its disasters. As when Sodom and Gomorrah and their neighboring cities were overthrown, says the Lord, no man shall dwell there, no man shall sojourn in her. Jeremiah's prediction then is this, that they're going to become a horror, and that happens later in history. This territory was later captured by John Hyrcanus during the years of silence. He made them Jewish proselytes. Herod the Great was Ijemaean on his father's side, and Herod the Great was the one who was made king of the Jews by the Romans. 
And by 100 AD, Edom as a race and as a nation had become lost. That's what Jeremiah had predicted. In a sense, that's what Obadiah is going to be predicting. And so, um, enter Obadiah. Here's some of his predictions. When you read Obadiah chapter 1 and verse 4, there's only one chapter, so it's all chapter 1. But Obadiah verse 4 says this, I will bring you down, says Jehovah. Verse 5, oh, how you will be cut off, judgment language. Verse 7, those who eat your bread shall lay a trap for you. Verse 8, I'm going to destroy the wise men from Edom. So several times within those first few verses of Obadiah, Obadiah is predicting the downfall of the Edomites. Gleason Archer says this in his commentary about this. He says, as for Obadiah's message of the judgment of God, which is to come upon Edom, it should be remembered that the Edomites were regarded by the prophets as typical of the malignant foes of Israel who hated and opposed all that Israel stood for in their witness to the one true God. And thus Edom became typical of the corrupt, hate-ridden world that was ripe for apocalyptic judgment. Every time you see Edom really in the prophets, it's never referred to in a positive light. It's always referred to in a negative light because they were the enemies of Israel rebellious to Israel. And God had promised, even from the very first with Abraham, whoever curses you, I'm going to curse. And Edom is going to curse themselves by their actions towards Israel and the people of the people of Israel. Pretty easy to outline Obadiah. It's really pretty short, and there's really two main sections. First main section is this, the destruction is coming, verses 1 through 14. Uh, the the God's judgment is certain, verses 1 through 9. This is definitely happening. And then verses 10 through 14, kind of note the reasons for God's judgment. On your question sheet, on the back page, I have really verses 10 through 14 summarized and broke down um, in a lot more detail than we're going to have time for tonight. But you can look at that if you want, that really, really specify the specific reasons God is upset with the Edomite people. The last few verses of the book are about the coming deliverance of Israel, though. Um, the nations are going to be punished, and God's people are going to have the opportunity to be delivered. The last few verses of Obadiah. Um, now, let's think about their reasons. We know that God has said judgment is coming to the Edomites, but let's take a specific look, just kind of walk through some verses and see why. Reason number one, um, verse three and four. They were haughty, and they had a haughty and self-sufficient attitude. Verses 3 and 4 says this, The pride of your heart has deceived you, you who live in the clefts of the rock, in your lofty dwelling, who say in your heart, Who will bring me down to the ground? Though you soar aloft like the eagle, and though your nest is set among the stars, from there I will bring you down, declares the Lord. Understanding that Edom was, was the, the people of Edom live basically in the mountains, in the sides of mountains, helps us to understand why these statements are made in verses 3 and 4. Notice this picture. He says, you who dwell in the clefts of the rock. This is Edom. Um, you can still go visit these areas of Edom. These are some of the old habitations where people were living literally in the clefts of the rock, in the sides of the mountains. Um, this is, what the Edom, this is how the Edomites lived, and because they lived in the sides of the mountains, and it was hard for people to get up those mountains and to those areas, they just didn't think anybody would ever bring them down. Um, uh, the area of Edom is really a beautiful area. I would like it maybe somewhat to a Sedona, Arizona kind of area with those red rocks and the mountains, very beautiful. Um, if you've ever been to Sedona. Uh, George Robinson says this as he writes about the area of Edom, and specifically Petra. Um, he says the rock that's referred to here is almost certainly Petra, which doubtless from earliest times was the central stronghold of the nation, sort of like the capital city of Edom to a degree. He says its location deep down among the mountains of Seir, surrounded on all sides with richly colored rocks of simply matchless beauty and grandeur, renders it a wonder of the desert. One enters the weird but attractive city enclosure by a narrow gorge 
over a mile long called the seek or the cleft. And this defile is one of the most magnificent and romantic avenues of its kind in all of nature. He goes on to say, the ruins of a castle and of buildings and the arches of a bridge and columns, they still stand scattered over the bottom of the city site. The entire city and its environs are one immense maze of richly colored mountains and cliffs, chasms, rocky shelves and narrow valleys, gorges and plateaus, shady dells and sunny promontories, grand and beautiful. Just the ideal of beauty and protection for a fortress of trade and commerce to satisfy an oriental nomad. But alas, desolation now reigns within and about it on every hand and Obadiah's warnings and predictions have been woefully verified. You can tell people live there, inhabited there. You can still go visit there and see the ruins, but nobody's living there now. Just like Obadiah had said, just like Jeremiah had said, nobody's living there now. Here's a uh, kind of a picture on the right-hand side. This is one of those gorges that you have to get to to get to uh, Petra. And that's, we're going to see a better picture of that in a moment. But that would be the view as you kind of walk through that narrow defile. You can imagine if you try to take an army through there, who do you think is going to be sitting on the other side of that little narrow cliff? Well, they're going to have their army just waiting for you, and they're going to kill you one by one as you try to, as you try to go through there. So they didn't think anybody ever beat them. Anybody would ever conquer them. Um, but Petra was the capital of Edom. It could only be approached by a long, narrow passageway, and a small group of soldiers could hold off a small army in Petra. Um, this is El Kaz, which is um, called the Treasury. It's hewn from reddish sandstone. You can still go visit this Petra today, but it was a mountain fortress. And these are the people who are dwelling in the clefts of the rock who didn't think anybody would ever defeat them. This is where the Edomites were living. This is where their fortress was. Here's kind of a further view. He says, though you set your nest among the stars, and, and you know they were, they were a mile high um, up here with their nest. That's a person right there. That shows you how big um, this is, that's, that's carved into the side of the mountain. It's an incredible, it's an incredible sight. Um, and here's the bird's eye view. I don't want to be that person, I'll tell you that. I'm never the person who's on the side of the cliff taking pictures, but because uh, I do not like heights, but those are people down there. Um, so that gives you a really good picture of what it's like in this area and why the language of verses 3 and 4 are used um, in Obadiah chapter 1 about um, Petra and the area the Edomites were living. It's very beautiful though, isn't it? That red rock and a lot of this is covered in water because um, obviously the water runs down off the cliffs and into that gorge area. So to make the trek, you got to get your feet wet to get there. Um, so those are some of the reasons. They were proud. They were haughty. They didn't think anybody would ever conquer them. But here's some other reasons. In verse 10, um, he's also going to punish them because of violence toward well, who, who he calls their brother, Jacob. Obviously, it's been a long time since Jacob and Esau when some of these acts of violence are occurring between Israel and Edom, but they still consider the nations brethren. They, they come from the same parent. And so, verse 10 says, Because of the violence done to your brother Jacob, shame shall cover you. You shall be cut off forever. God doesn't like the violence that happens within that family. Not only that, but when Jacob needed help, for example, when they needed to take the king's highway to make it through the wilderness, they refused to help. Um, and Obadiah chapter 1 and verse 11 notes that. On the day that you stood aloof, on the day that strangers carried off his wealth and foreigners entered his gates and cast lots for Jerusalem, you were like one of them. Um, so certainly not just numbers, the numbers episode that's being mentioned here, there was some other conflict where Edom could have come and helped out their neighbors, but they didn't come help their neighbors. They just kind of stood and watched it happen kind of like the priest and the Levite that passed by on the other side. The good Samaritan had the decency to go help. Well, Edom, there were times Edom could have helped Judah, and they refused to do so. So they're going to be judged for that, punished for that. Not only did they not help, but there were times Edom rejoiced in the affliction of the people of Israel. Um, and that's really an awful attitude. Not only am I not going to help you while you're in trouble, but I'm happy you're in trouble. I'm happy this is happening to you. So Obadiah 1, 12 and 13 um, refers to that. It says, do not gloat over the day of your brother in the day of his misfortune. Do not rejoice over the people of Judah in the day of their ruin. Do not boast in the day of distress. 
Do not enter the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. Do not gloat over his disaster in the day of his calamity. We're supposed to rejoice with those who rejoice and we're supposed to weep with those who weep, but they're rejoicing when they're weeping. And they're not supposed to be doing that. They're going to be punished for that. They're rejoicing in the affliction. Not only that, but when they were afflicted, Edom used that, apparently at some point in time in history, to loot from the people of Israel, which is their own family. They stole from them while they were down. So verse 13, at the, the last part of that verse says, Do not loot his wealth in the day of his calamity. Um, they had taken advantage of him while they were hurting. Then look at verse 14. Not only that, they sold some of Jacob's people as slaves. They aided their enemies by doing so. So verse 14 says, Do not stand at the crossroads to cut off his fugitives. Do not hand over his survivors in the day of distress. And so there must have been a time where Edom, perhaps, we don't know if it was during the Assyrian captivity, the, uh, whether it's through the Babylonian captivity or some other time, perhaps when Egypt came up from the south, but there was some some point in time in their history where they actually aided and abetted the enemy nations of Israel and handed over the survivors to become slaves. Um, and God's going to punish them for that. He's also going to punish Edom basically as retribution. Just like you punish other people, I'm going to punish you. This is payback. So he says, the day of the Lord is near upon all the nations, and as you have done, it shall be done to you. You're going to reap what you sow. Your deeds shall return on your own head. Um, one more thing is mentioned, I believe, in verse 16, and that is just that Edom had a very godless and a very careless attitude. He says, the day of the Lord is near upon all the nations. That, there's that day of the Lord language that we heard in Joel, and here we're hearing it again in Obadiah. Some people think Joel was copying off of Obadiah. Some people think Obadiah was copying off of Joel using that phrase. Maybe they both just use the same phrase. You don't have to necessarily be copying off of somebody, but um, the day of the Lord. In other words, a judgment is coming upon the nations. As you have done, it shall be done to you. Your deed shall return on your own head and um, calls them out. Um, but last few verses, verse 17 through 21, are verses that talk about one day Jehovah is going to deliver deliver the people of Edom, and there will be a day of deliverance. That deliverance, though, is not going to come in Edom. That deliverance, he says, is going to come on Mount Zion. Where's Mount Zion? I think we've talked about this in another class. Jerusalem, right? That's Mount Zion. Um, so verse 17 says, on Mount Zion there shall be deliverance. Mount Zion, of course, who's going to be crucified and resurrected on Mount Zion? That's Jesus Christ. So I think this is looking ahead to the day that, yes, just as Abraham was promised that through your seed, all nations can be saved and can be blessed. Jesus Christ would bless one day the Edomites again through his death on a cross, his burial and his resurrection. And everyone could be part of that kingdom. But deliverance was never going to come again on Mount Seir, never going to come to Edom itself as an earthly nation. It would come through Jesus Christ on Mount Zion. Israel would possess Edom and other nations, verses 19 and 20 mention, and the ultimate rule would belong to Jehovah, and they would look to him as king. Savior shall go up to Mount Zion, verse 21 says, to rule Mount Esau, and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. Not your king, not their earthly king, the kingdom shall be the Lord's. Look at a prophecy really quick, so I don't know if I have time to hit this. I have it later in the slides, but look at Luke chapter 1 and verse 33. When Jesus was born, or even before his birth, when it was announced he would be born, look at Luke chapter 1 and verse 33. It says that Jesus, in verse 32, he will be great. He will be called the Son of the Highest. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. He's going to be a king. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. That's what Obadiah is looking to. He's looking to the day when there's going to be a forever king reign over the house of Jacob. And that forever king, Luke tells us um, through, the, through the angel here, is going to be Jesus. He's going to be the forever king reigning from Zion that one day will bring deliverance to all people, including the people of Edom. And so that's how I think this passage looks ahead to the Messiah. 
We've been trying to connect every prophecy to see how it points ahead to the Messiah. Haley says this on verse 17. Homer Haley in his commentary on the Minor Prophets says, Mount Zion represents Jehovah's stronghold. It's a place of protection for Jehovah was there. It's a place of worship for there he had recorded his name. There's another phrase there in verse 17. It says, there shall be holiness. Or as he phrases it, it shall be holy. It's going to be made up of redeemed and sanctified people. Um, starting there in Jerusalem, that's the church, the redeemed, those who are sanctified. There shall be holiness on Mount Zion. The house of Jacob refers not to the physical descendants only, but to the future house of the redeemed. For it was said of Jesus, he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. And so um, he points ahead to the Messiah with verse 17. Well, I've got five simple lessons. This is the last slide. Five simple lessons that we can learn from Obadiah. Lesson number one, the folly of pride. These people were prideful. In fact, they thought that they were so powerful and so strong, God could never bring them down. What does the book of Proverbs say about prideful people? Pride comes before a fall. Pride comes before a fall. These are prideful people, and um, they were not more powerful than God. Um, the other thing is they put their faith, it would seem, in some human alliances. Perhaps they had made friends with other nations around them. They thought that that would make them strong. Look at verse 7. We didn't talk about verses 7 through 9. But verse 7 says, All the men in your confederacy shall force you to the border. The men at peace with you that they'd made perhaps a treaty with, they shall deceive you and prevail against you. Those who eat your bread shall lay a trap for you. No one is aware of it. Will I not in that day, says the Lord, even destroy the wise men from Edom and understanding from the mountains of Esau? Then your mighty men, O Teman, shall be dismayed to the end that everyone from the mountains of Esau may be cut off by slaughter. They had made alliances, a confederacy, as the, the translation says here, um, but human alliances can fail us. We need to make sure our alliance is with God um, because other people will fail us, but God won't fail us. Um, also, Perhaps just, I think the main idea of Obadiah is love your brethren and even love your enemies. And even though the Edomites and Israel had become enemies, there was still just some cruel and harsh and unjust and um, wicked things that Edom did to Israel. Um, rejoicing that they were falling, not helping when they could help him, um, not letting an entire nation just travel on their highway to get to the other side not letting them have any water as they pass through. Think about the children, think about the mothers, the pregnant women um, that would be suffering as they had to walk through the, 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 either near the salt sea or around through the desert to get there. How heartless and cruel was it to not have just the humanitarianism to care enough about their fellow man to force them to do that. And so Obadiah just teaches us to be, to love people, to care about people, even your enemies. Um, love your enemies, Jesus says in Matthew 5. And Romans 12 says, render not vengeance for vengeance. You heap coals of fire upon people's heads by doing them good and not evil, even if they are your enemies. If you want to change your enemies to friends, you have to be kind to them and good to them. Uh, so we won't ever change our enemies to friends if we keep treating them like enemies. We're going to reap what we sow. Obadiah 1, 15, 16, he says, just as you have done, it's going to be done to you. And if we don't repent... Galatians 6 says, you're going to reap what you sow. God knows. He's not mocked. He knows what you've done. And then finally, in God, there is true deliverance. And Hebrews 12 looks ahead to that day where we find deliverance on Zion through Jesus Christ.